okay so as you have seen in the previous lectures uh, i introduced the second law in the previous lecture i introduced the second law of thermodynamics and i told also uh, that uh, entropy is a we introduced the concept of entropy and we told entropy is a state function and for that to prove that entropy is a state function we used the carnot cycle right we used the carnot cycle uh, where we have this isothermal uh, which is a cyclic process and we told that for this cyclic process there is a there is a quantity called delta q reverse over by t which is nothing but equals to cyclic so cyclic ds so this is a cyclic integral over the entire cyclic process which is equal to c right so we so we have shown that this uh, ds indeed is equal to zero for a cyclic process so what that what that meant is basically that if you have some sort of a if you have a cyclic process any cyclic process say and you start at point i and then you are moving around and you go to say some point f and then again you go to i so what we are telling is if i start my initial state is i and my final state is also i then my delta s since s is a state function should depend on s it should be s equal to s i minus s i which is equal to zero right this is what we have proved by using a Carnot circle right and right so this is the this is exactly that's what i have shown here so if you see this is delta q reverse over t and this is um, uh, integral ds again cyclic integral ds which is equal to c so this proved effectively that this delta q reversible by t is a state function and uh, uh, right it, or q reversible by t represents a state function and that state function is entropy and like internal energy uh, it, since it's a straight from state function for any cyclic process um, my where my initial state and uh, final state are the same the 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 the, uh, the change in state function uh, becomes zero now this we have proved for the carnot cycle but we have considered if you remember an ideal gas but it does not matter whether i am using an ideal gas gas or any other substance whether it's an ideal gas or a real gas or for any other substance the cyclic integral of entropy the, the of the differential changes in entropy the cyclic integral over this differential changes in entropy will always come out to be zero right entropy remains a state function whatever whatever be the substance that we are using right it is exactly as much of a state function as in the energy right so however very interestingly what we also told that we talked about reversibility and irreversibility right as uh, as you remember second law is a it basically gives you the definition of irreversibility it gives you the definition of directionality of a process right uh, for, of a natural process right and it also tells you um, how the entropy will change right the the entropy being a property of the universe how it will, how will it change right it will always move in a particular direction irrespective of whatever process occurs right so that is what we have understood so far now another thing if you have this Carnot cycle or heat engine that it's a reversible heat engine by the way and if you look at that we can basically define efficiency to be what the say for example you have a, a, a hot a, a hot source from which heat is input to the engine and then there is a cold sink where some waste heat is collected and you are producing work from the engine right the work performed by the engine so if i take the work performed by the heat absorbed by the by the engine as the definition of efficiency then we can write efficiency equals to mod of w by qh mod of w y because we have used a uh, we generally use this convention means at least in this course we are using this convention that work done on the system is positive work done by the system okay or here the engine is the system is negative right so we are taking work perform the 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 modulus modulus of it so, right so it, whether it's negative or positive it does not really matter so the modulus of work performed uh, by the engine divided by the heat absorbed right from the hot source is what is going to define the efficiency 
Now, if you see that, if I use this definition of efficiency, this uh, definition of efficiency, let us further understand what does this mean. So, if you look at this diagram, you have this hot source where the temperature is Th and you have this cold sink, the temperature is Tc and you have the engine here, right. Okay, in this engine some cyclic process is being performed, right. So, you have like mm, isothermal compression, then you have some adiabatic uh, expansion, the um, isothermal expansion, adiabatic expansion followed by isothermal compression and then adiabatic compression, okay. So, for example, such a cycle. So, in such a case, this is your engine, right, this is your engine and you have the hot source and the cold sink and you see, so remember there is one reservoir here, one reservoir here. The reservoir at high temperature is from where the heat is being transferred to the engine. So, it heat input from the hot source and heat rejected to the cold sink and there is also this work that is produced by the engine that is mod of W or work done by the engine. Now, you can easily see that if that is so and also we know this relation that we have obtained for current engine that is Qc by Qh, okay, that is the heat rejected by heat absorbed equals to minus Tc by Ph. Now, epsilon is as you see mod of W which is nothing but Qh minus Qc because Qh is plus, right, it is heat input, heat input is positive, heat rejected by the system is negative, so it is basically Qh minus Qc by Qh, right. But we are using, we are retaining the plus sign here, that is not a problem because Qc by itself is negative, Qh by itself is positive, so it is like 1 plus Qc by Qh which is the same as 1 minus Tc by Th, right, 1 minus Tc by Th, where Tc is the temperature of the cold, mm, uh, the temperature of the cold sink and Th is the temperature of the hot, uh, hot source. Now, as you can see here, the efficiency depends on the temperature of the source and the sink, right, which is basically given by, this you can further expand to write it as Th minus Tc by Th. You can immediately see that it does not, the efficiency of the heat engine of this heat engine that we are talking about does not depend on the substance that is used in the engine, right, does not depend on the nature of the gas that is used in the engine, right, it only depends on the temperature of the hot source and temperature of the cold sink. Now, that one very important thing I want to tell as a corollary is that all reversible engines will have the same efficiency regardless of the material used. Regardless of the material used, it will have the same efficiency and another very interesting thing here you can see, if I put Tc equal to 0 Kelvin, then my efficiency goes to 1. Efficiency becomes 1 when Tc is 0 Kelvin, right. You cannot have efficiency more than 1, right. So, so when Tc is 0 Kelvin, you can immediately see here, right, that if Tc is say immediately see here that if Tc is equal to 0, then this is Th minus 0 by Th, which is Th by Th which is equal to 1, right. In other cases, when Tc is not 0 Kelvin, we will always have efficiency which is less than 1, right. Uh, okay. Now, think of this, what we told is all reversible engines for operating at the same temperature, means operating at the same temperatures of the cold, uh, hot hot source means for a given temperature of hot source and for a given temperature of the cold sink okay all reversible engines that have the same hot source temperature and cold sink temperature should have the same efficiency regardless of the material used right so for example think of this as this particular configuration you have th here and you have this TL, TL or TC is the cold sink temperature and TH is the hot source temperature. So, in this case, um, uh, let us call it TC instead of TL, let us call it TC. I am using TC as the cold sink temperature. Okay, now you see, I have just hypothetically thought that, uh, once we have thought that there are two engines here, one is E1, another is E2, and we have also assumed that. E1 is more efficient, let us suppose that E1 is more efficient than E2. Now, if it is so, so if say let, let us suppose that the efficiency of E1 is eta1, which is mod of W1 by Q, Qh and eta2, which is the efficiency of E2, 
and it, that efficiency is slightly uh, less than that of eta 1 means slightly or some way less right it is less so what we are talking about is eta 1 is greater than eta 2 right so we are talking about eta 1 is greater than eta 2 and what is eta 1 eta 1 is so it is extracting a what w1 so it is extracting a, the e1 is extracting a what w1 so mod of w1 by qh is basically eta 1 and eta 2 is mod of w2 by qh now if eta 1 is greater than eta 2 obviously mod of w1 is greater than mod of eta w2 now if you look at this what you are talking about if you look at it more precisely you are actually absorbing heat qh from the hot source then you are transferring some QL1 is rejected to the cold sink. Now this QL1, so but from the cold sink now there is a QL2 that is coming. So what I have done is instead of using two separate heat engines, I have made one of these a heat pump. So E1 is acting like a heat pump to E2. So what is happening from, so if you look at E1, so E1, uh, so E2 is your heat pump. So if you look at this here, E2 is your heat pump and E1 is your heat engine in this case. I have just reversed the, 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 the process in E2. So it becomes a heat pump and this is your heat engine. Now what is happening? The work produced by heat engine E1 is now directly taken to E2. So work is done on E2 now and there is also QL2 that is entering from the cold a cold sink the cold sink has now become a source for e2 and you are basically now rejecting a heat of qh or right or you are producing a heat qh uh, to the uh, hot reservoir which is maintained at pH. now you can see here qh comes in and there is a w1 done and this w1 is the work done by the uh, by e1 and it rejects ql1 and say and now from the cold sink QL2 is coming into E2 right because E2 is now acting as a heat pump and it is taking also W1 and then it is producing this heat QH which is coming to hot reservoir. Now if that is the condition then there is one very interesting thing that comes in because see W1 we told is the work done by E1 right and by E2 it is W2. Now if I now just look at the balance you have if you look at this QL2 is coming in right so QL2 is coming in and then QL2 and W1 produces QH right so QL2 plus W1 is QH right now this implies what this implies QH minus W2 plus W1 equal to QH why is that so why is QL2 QH minus W2 because if you look at this QH, if I look at E2 as a heat engine, then QH is the heat input, right? QH is the heat input and W2 is the work done and then QL2 is the heat rejected. So QL2 is QH minus W2, right? QH minus W2 is uh, uh, QL2, that's what I have substituted here. And you have also this W1 and you have again here Q. So basically what it tells is W1 minus W2 is equal to 0. So definitely W1 has to be equal to W2, right? Because um, uh, as you can see here, so W1 equal to W2. Remember this is a cyclic process. So even here, please try to understand this is very, very important to understand that he for any state function for any cyclic process the du is also going to be 0 right however can you tell means say that this, this is something that you have to think about so you have a cyclic process and you have pdv is this equal to 0 you will see that it is not equal to 0 you look at the Carnot cycle for example you look at the isobaric isothermal pro isobaric isoporic process cycle for example that we looked at in the second class you will always see that the, 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 the cyclic integral of PdV is not equal to 0 but however because see P is a state function V is also a state function right but it is a 
integral p d v right so so this this need not be a, uh, this need not be uh, equal to uh, zero right and in in general uh, it is the area under the p v curve right so if if it is area under the p v curve you have often seen even for Carnot cycle and all that it is not really equal to zero so please have a look at it and think about it now but you can see that now in this case w1 and w2 cannot be different they should be equal now in such a case what if w if it is so now you see there is a very important violation that is occurring when the efficiencies are different see from th it is coming in to e1 e1 is producing work w1 and then there is this q l and this q l is directly entering the engine e2 and there is w1 and it gives you kh so you don't require if the cold reservoir is no longer required not required the cold reservoir the cold sink is not required in this process now if that is so the entire heat is basically getting converted to what that's what it, it, it basically boils down to uh, in some sense and if you do not have a reservoir means you should have like kelvin's statement was that you should have a hot source you should have a cold sink and there should be some heat rejected to the cold sink right if there is some work done by the by a uh, heat engine right so that means that you cannot really have in the case in this case the statement is not valid so that means all reversible heat engines that means for example e1 and e2 they should have the same efficiency regardless of the material right so this is something that becomes very very important another thing that we told that see it is independent of the sub substance used why because efficiency ultimately depends on th and tc right these are the hot source temperatures and cold sink temperatures so this is something that you should so efficiency as i told you is a function of th and tc right now remember that if you fix tc if you want to increase efficiency by fixing a tc which is not really this, uh, if you take fix tc to 0 kelvin then you get epsilon equal to 1 that is one thing and second thing if you fix tc to some other temperature you uh, you want to if you want to increase the efficiency of the engine you want to make th as large as possible right now so again as i told you that uh, note that you, when we proved that this del q rev by t the result of q reversal by normalized by temperature or uh, uh, which is definition uh, definition of bs equal to uh, zero for a cyclic process we have used an ideal gas right we have used an ideal gas so but again from the definition of efficiency and for any cyclic process basically by the way if you look at this you will see that any cyclic any arbitrary cyclic process can be presented uh, can be basically presented by a series of Carnot cycles right so this is something that you can uh, uh, do by yourself but i will have some more elegant proofs uh, soon that i'll show uh, where we can basically look at whether it is ideal gas whether it is any other substance the the the, the idea of state function does not change um, uh, that is something that i will uh, show uh, in the uh, next few uh, basically in the next few slides so let us go to the next one so as you can see here in the next uh, so if you go to this next idea that i want to show here so if you start with first law as you have seen in first law is a law of conservation of energy that du equals to q minus pd now this q basically again we can think that is the reversal of q so but uh, we will tell it like delta q minus pd right this is delta q and delta because it's a path function delta q by itself is path function but delta q by t is a state function remember so integral delta q depends on the path right of the process right the path that is taken in the process right however integral delta q by t does not depend on the path but it depends on the initial state and the final state note that right this is path dependent But this becomes path independent. It only depends on the initial and the final states. Now, 
Now, as I told you that u is a state function, so cyclic integral of du is equal to 0, right? This is correct. This is correct. However, p dv, which is a, which is, is p is here one state function, v is one state function, but integral of p dv is not equal to 0, right? If you look at the Thomas cycle also, this is the end of the curve. Here also, say for example, you have a, uh, say for example, this process where you start with a uh, pressure of say P1 and at this constant pressure P1, so this is an isobaric process, you have a uh, have an expansion, right? You have an expansion in volume for this P1, so it goes to 2 say and then you have an isochoric process where I just increase the pressure to 3 and then I go to again, it, we maintain the pressure P2 and I compress it to the state 4 and then again I come back to, again I have an isochoric process from, by which my pressure is reduced to P1, right. So, in this entire process if you see, immediately you can understand from this uh, process that I have drawn in the PV curve that this process definitely PDV is not going to be equal to 0, right. It is not going to be equal to 0. So, um, uh, here or even if you can check that Carnot, Carnot cycle that I have drawn, so you can easily understand that this integral PDV is not going to be C. Again, integral delta Q, cyclic integral delta Q is also not equal to 0 because it is a path function. Now, what I am doing is, I have this equation, V equals to delta Q minus PDV, I divide it by T. So, what I get is du by T equals to delta Q by T minus T by T du. Okay. Now, again I use for one mole of gas, I use the ideal gas law. So, I have du by t minus delta q by t equals to, because this is p by t, p by t is nothing but, so here you can see here, p by t equals to r by v, where r is the gas constant. So, it becomes r by v dv. Now, integral delta u, du by t is going to be equal to 0. Okay, this is something that you can prove, right. So, integral du is going to be 0 and normalized by t also, integral du by t also is going to be 0. Right? So, that has to be 0 because it, it, the cyclic integral of du itself is 0, cyclic integral of du by t is also um, uh, going to be 0. You can actually show this uh, you, if you, if you, if you uh, look at this, if you just consider any cycle, you can see the change in u and you can normalize with t and you can see the cyclic integral that comes out to be 0. And another thing, why it is 0? It, that it is 0 definitely for an ideal gas, right? Because u for an ideal gas is only a function of temperature. Then I can write du equals to CVD, right? Du. So why is this 0 for an ideal gas? At least for an ideal gas, I can immediately show you. This is because du equals to CVD, right? And because u is only a function of t, it's not a function of v, right? U del u del v uh, for an ideal gas uh, uh, goes to 0, right? So now, if I have that, so I have du by t, which is Cv dt. So this is basically integral. So integral du by t is nothing but integral Cv dt by t. This I can write as Cv dl and t, right? So dl and t, right? And this l and t. So you can think of this as some some state function. Why? So, if you can see Cv dy and this, this Cv dl and t is definitely going to be 0, right, for, for the cyclic process. So, because for the cyclic process, you are starting with the state i and you are coming back to the state i and you are only looking at the at state i, what is the change. So, you will basically see that Cv dl and t in this case is going to be equal to Similarly, R d l n v, right, R by v d v, I can write this as integral of R d l n v, which is again going to be 0. So, as a result, delta q reversible by t has to be equal to 0 equals to basically the cyclic integral of dx. Now, if I, I can ask you this question, please try to solve this. This is, uh, uh, I think that that will be interesting because you can by yourself realize that delta q rev 
by t reversible by t although that is a state function the cyclic integral goes to 0 delta q reversible by p on the other hand is not a path independent function it is definitely a path dependent function so two things have to be understood one is the integral p dv cyclic integral p dv does not go to 0 another thing i have here del q rev by t which comes out to be 0 here but del q rev by p the cyclic integral is not going to be 0 right so that means it is not a path independent function so if i look at other substance right we when we want to say that okay when we want to prove that okay if it is true for ideal gas it has to be also true for other substance and we have tried to uh, tell that we, we we showed that definitely from the definition of efficiency you can immediately understand that if since the efficiency depends only on the hot um, uh, hot source and the cold sink in general uh, you, you can immediately understand that it really does not depend on the substance whether it's a real gas or an ideal gas um, the, 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 the cyclic integral remains uh, zero but you can also prove that how when you want to prove that you take a system which is isolated isolated means it has uh, if i take an isolated system the, the overall isolated system then there is no exchange of heat or uh, the heat or matter between the the system and the surroundings right um, there is no uh, exchange of heat and matter and moreover the the, the, the isolated system is covered with a re, this is separated from the surroundings by rigid uh, adiabatic uh, wall rigid adiabatic wall which is also impermeable to any type of mass transfer so if you is if it is rigid you can also not apply any stress over the overall system right you cannot apply pressure or anything so now in this system we consider subsystems so this concept of subsystems becomes very very important when when we will discuss equilibrium so you have a subsystem so you have a wall you have a wall fitted with a valve okay there is a valve here so valve i think the symbol we will show it as a circular stuff and we put it like this okay so this represents a valve see for us it represents a valve this is a valve okay now this valve is closed initially so that we are not allowing beside the gas and the substance to uh, mix right so there is a this some uh, so this substance can be a real gas or whatever so you have an ideal gas and you have a real, uh, sub another substance that is in the other chamber right and they are fit uh, they are basically separated by a wall now what we know is that the delta q reversible by t for the ideal gas is equal to zero that means for this system so this this of system that has denoted as one i know this but for this system it is uh, so, uh, denoted as two and which has a real substance or real gas whether it, this is true or not we do not know right so instead of writing the substance this substance is basically we can write this some substance is okay now if i have that now if you see we have this isolated system and one and two are there and the point is you have this ideal gas we have real substance and one and two can exchange so the idea is that it is you cannot exchange matter but you can exchange heat so we are assuming this wall the internal wall to be diathermal that means one and two can exchange heat reversal now if that is so see for example in one i am telling the amount of heat that is uh, um, is uh, uh, there or absorbed is or the amount of heat uh, associated with subsystem one is delta q1 okay that is the heat absorbed okay uh, or heat input to the system the subsystem one and delta q2 is the heat input in subsystem two so then definitely there this is a nice the overall it is an iso isolated system so heat cannot be exchanged to the surroundings right so delta q1 plus delta q2 have to be equal to zero okay and we are telling one and two are in equilibrium right so one and two are in equilibrium isolated system nothing no heat can transfer so you have delta q1 plus delta q2 that has to be equal to zero now 
we are telling that the equilibrium means we are talking about an equilibrium thermal equilibrium say for example both have the same temperature okay so the temperature so at thermal equilibrium this is also t this is also t now you are telling you divide both by t so you have del q1 by t and del q2 by t that also has to be zero now but this one we know is zero this is equal to zero for the ideal gas del q f by t is zero that we have already proved now if this is zero if this part is zero and the overall is zero then this part which is basically considering a real substance the del q rev by t also has to be zero so therefore this del q rev by t whether you are using a, a different substance than ideal gas is going to be zero right this is one way of again proving the same idea now comes a very interesting part of the second law and that is called Clausius inequality right where the Clausius inequality states that there is this ds which is greater than or equal to d delta q by t already we know now from the second law uh, definition and for the for the reversible process that ds equals to delta q reversible by t that means in the, the inequality case the ds has to be greater than delta q irreversible so delta q irr is delta q reversible right right now how do we prove that now as you see the sec the first law is also varied that is principle of conservation of energy so the change in internal energy du change in energy du equals to delta q plus delta w now i can tell that this delta q is some arbitrary say for some universal process and this is also for some universal process okay i can tell but delta q irr plus delta w irr but du is equal to also if i think of this as a reversible thing so you have du equals to delta q reversible plus delta w reversible right so both are correct right the change if i replace delta q reversible by delta q irreversible and delta w reversible by delta w irreversible then the 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 the, the, the point is that uh, the, the point is that the du in both cases we can always have this equality right du equals to delta q plus delta w for any type of process whether it is a reversible or irreversible does not matter but delta q plus delta w for any process should be having the same d right because of the first first law so this equality holds we assume that this equality holds we want to show that the Clausius inequality statement is correct what does this mean see is that ds is equal to delta q reversible by t however ds is greater than delta q reversible by t now think of this what we want to tell here is more uh, the, the, the in terms of what so the what done by the system during a reversal process which is minus delta w there or you can write mod of delta w there is always greater than for an inversal process so delta w there is greater than delta or we can write see what we are telling is this is what done by the system is negative so delta w rev so this basically means minus delta w reversible right that is the work done by the reversible process this is work done by the irreversible process let us call it delta w i r r now what we are telling is delta w reversible will be greater than delta w reversible but it will be equal to so that's why i do not want to put the subscript i r r right we do not want to put the subscript i r r that when delta w reversible equal to delta w in such cases the delta uh, the, for this particular arbitrary process also it's a reversal it has to be a reversal the equality sign only holds for reversible processes however for irreversible processes delta w reversal that is the heat the, the amount of what extracted from a reversal process is always greater than the amount of what extracted from any other process right so if we have this inequality we can also write this as delta w and we take delta w on the left hand side 
So you can write this as delta W minus delta W there is greater than equal to 0. Right? Again, equality holds only for when both delta W and delta W wave are reversible, represent reversible processes. Now, what is delta W minus delta W rev? If you see delta Q, so if I write this, so if I just remove this thing, so we have delta Q plus delta W is delta Q rev plus delta W rev, right? So that's what we have right, we have written that. So delta Q plus delta W equals to delta Q reverse rev plus delta W. Reversible. Therefore, we can tell from this relation that delta W minus delta W reversible, right? If I take delta W reversible this side and I take delta Q the other side. So, then equal to delta Q reversible minus delta Q. Now, this has to be greater than or equal to 0. So, delta Q reversible is greater than or equal to delta Q. So, delta Q reversible by T is greater than or equal to delta Q by T. But delta Q by T is for an linear arbitrary process. The equality holds again for the reversible process. Now, delta Q reversible by T, what is the definition of delta Q reversible by T? That is nothing but Ds. And Ds that means is greater than equal to delta Q by T. That means that is the Clausius inequality. So, Ds Again, just to recap, Ds is delta Q reversible by T. For any other process other than reversible, Ds is greater than delta Q. Any other process means which is not reversible. So, that means reversible. I can write this, sub this subscript of IRR, which is a reversible process. And we can tell that this is what is process inequality. Now, what is the what is the what uh, meaning of Clausius inequality? Clausius inequality basically tells you the directionality of a process. For example, heat will always flow from a hot body to a cold body, not vice versa. Means from a heat will not be and unless you have connected an engine or fitted an engine or you are uh, to uh, or uh, you are making a heat pump where you have something where work is being done, work is being done on the uh, system. Uh, you cannot have spontaneous flow of heat from cold body to hot body, but you can have it from hot to cold, right? How do you prove that using Clausius inequality? As we know that ds is greater than equal to delta Q by T and this now if you have hot body, so you have say delta Qh that is coming out of the hot body and delta Qc which is entering the cold body. So, I can hot body is at temperature Th. So, what we are telling? Th is greater than Tc and delta Qh is the heat transferred from the hot body and delta Qc is the heat transferred into the cold body. So, you have Ds is greater than or equal to delta Qh by Th plus delta Qc by Tc and delta Qh is basically leaving, right? It is leaving. So, delta Qh has to be negative, right? It is leaving the system, right? it is not heat input, but it is heat output from the hot body. And delta Qc is entering, entering means it is positive, right? So, delta Qc is minus of delta Qh, that is the point. So, now Ds equal to delta Qh by Qh minus delta Qh by Qc or if I take delta Qh common, which is negative, remember this is negative, you have 1 by Th minus 1 by Qh. Now, 1 by, now if delta Qh is negative, and Ds has to be greater than, right? Ds has to be greater than delta Q by T. Then, if Ds has to be greater than or equal to, <coughs> so delta Qh is negative. So, 1 by Th minus 1 by Tc also has to be negative, right? Now, 1 by Th minus 1 by Tc have to be negative means it has to be less than 0 or equal to 0 in the equality case. Now, if that is so, since Tc is less than or equal to Th, since Tc, so if 1 minus 1 by Th minus 1 by Tc is less than or equal to 0, you can immediately see 1 by Th minus 1 by Tc 
is equal to th tc and this is tc minus th now tc is less than th therefore this 1 by th minus 1 by tc has to be less than c right only when tc equal to th then only it is equal to 0 so 1 minus 1 by th minus 1 by tc tc in general will be less than c or tc has to be less than th so for the ds to be greater than equal to c that means heat will always flow out of the hot body into the cold body right so this is the directionality we have assumed and this direction is correct if you would have done the other way ds has to have been less than zero which is not possible ds has to be greater than zero according to Clausius inequality which again comes from the second law okay second law basically defines the direction of the natural process now you will tell me okay what happens in an isolated system for so completely isolated system we can have subsystems but we have already shown that delta q in an isolated system the delta q right the amount of heat input or output is going to be equal to zero right it, because it's an adiabatic system it's, it has adiabatic walls right it cannot uh, exchange heat uh, with the surrounding so delta q is going to be zero but depending on whether the process is so if the process is a reversible process that is happening in, in the isolated system then ds equal to zero this is for Reversal, reversal processes. But if it's a natural process and irreversible process, then ds has to be greater than zero or continuous processes. This is for. This is basically for isolated system. So. Remember, for an isolated system, your outside, basically your wall that separates the system and the surroundings is adiabatic. Now, if it is adiabatic, delta Q is 0, but ds is greater than 0. So, entropy does not decrease. So, this is the most important part. Entropy does not decrease in an isolated system, but it increases in an isolated system when there is a spontaneous change. If there is a spontaneous change, that means a spontaneous process or an irreversible process, the ds does not increase but it increases right in an isolated system however ds can be equal to zero for processes that are not spontaneous and reversible now let us think of this uh, example that we are talking about 100 degrees celsius and one atmosphere pressure and we are talking about this particular process water liquid goes to water vapor at 100 degree celsius now remember water vapor and water liquid are at equilibrium at 100 degree celsius because if you look at say for example you take a pot with uh, water and you put it on a burner and you raise the temperature to 100 degrees you see at 100 degrees you see these bubbles that are coming out right inside the water and this water is started boiling right but you will see that water is still remaining right you, you are not if you if you remain exactly at 100 degrees celsius you see there is an equilibrium between liquid water and water vapor right because that is the transition temperature at one atmosphere pressure again if i change the atmosphere if i change the pressure then water can boil um, at a different at a different temperature right so so either it can depending on uh, depending on the pressure that uh, the system experiences water can boil at a lower temperature or at a higher temperature right so 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 it depends on that so this is a phase so basically if you look at that this is a transition temperature transition temperature is the temperature at which water in two states the liquid state as well as the vapor state are in equilibrium right so in this at this transition temperature any transfer of heat right if i want to transfer heat so that water goes water liquid goes to water vapor okay this heat the this heat transfer is reversible in this way that i can also think of uh, uh, extracting heat in such a way reversibly in such a way that water vapor condenses to liquid water right so at this temperature right so basically it's a transition temperature so at this transition temperature since both are possible all the transfer of heat is going to be reversible now if that is so now delta q reversible again this is at constant pressure right so as you know delta q p this i have uh, right delta q p is nothing but 
delta h right so at constant pressure what you are basically telling is del or this is not correct you have to write delta q t equals to d h right the differential so you are telling so basically if i think this way q reversible so that means q reversible q p reversible should be equals to delta h now delta but q reversible equals to t delta s transformation right we can write delta h transformation equals to t delta s transformation right so as a result delta s transformation that means change in entropy at the transient temperature is basically nothing but delta h uh, transition by t right so this is something that that is very very important um, so as you know q plus w equals to uh delta u right so and what i am talking about is so w so this is like um q delta yeah so q minus p delta v equals to delta u now q equals to delta u Plus p delta v. Now that is a constant pressure because there is no v delta p. Oops. I'm sorry. Is ah, ah, delta u plus p delta v. So as you can see here, and delta u plus del p delta v is nothing but delta h at constant pressure. Right? This is u at constant pressure. At constant pressure. So this is equal to delta H. Now Q P is also basically the same as right? so because it's if if the heat transfer is reversible, right? At transient temperature is reversible, right? Heat transfer is reversible. So this is Q P reversible. So this is reversible. So if this is reversible, then it is also equal to P delta S. So delta H equal to P delta S at the transient temperature P T R. So basically, what we are telling is delta H T R. Tr is the at the transition temperature or delta H transformation is equal to P delta S transformation. Delta S transformation is the entropy change associated with transformation and therefore delta S transformation can be obtained if I know the enthalpy of transformation and I divide it by the transformation temperature Ptr. Okay, so that is the idea. So if that is so, let us now. So basically, as you can see now, that the 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 the, the, the enthalpy of transformation and entropy of transformation are related, and their the relation is basically based on the uh, the means. It says that delta H transformation is nothing but delta H transformation by T transformation. Now think of this. Uh, let us think of an, another problem, right? We can think of this pro uh, one problem in this same line. So we are talking about calculate the change in entropy when an ideal monoatomic gas at 30 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere pressure is allowed to expand right from 0.5 liters to one liter and is heated to 100 degrees Celsius at the same time. Now you can think of this. So it is first allowed to expand from 0.5 liters to one liter, where you are keeping the gas at 30 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere pressure. Right, so reversible isothermal expansion at 30 degrees Celsius is the first process. We can think of this as two processes. And the second process is basically heating of the gas at constant volume. Right, you are just heating the gas at constant volume, I, I, and we are assuming the gas to be ideal and no atomic. Right, so that means we are assuming this equation is PV equals to energy. Now, if you see this. You have ds, which is nothing but delta q reversible by t, right? This is from your second law, right? Second law is giving you this. So delta s, if I know this, so I can write integral ds equals to integral delta q raised by t. And as I told you that this is all state function, so I can take i state i and then state f, right? That's what I have done. Right, you can see the equation here. That's what we have done. Now, remember, 
this is a so what we are talking about is reversible isothermal expansion at 30 degree celsius right so we are telling first that temperature is constant which is equal to 30 degree celsius so delta s then can be written as the integral basically is basically delta s the integral is basically going to be delta s delta s is equals to 1 by t delta q reversible and delta q reversible integral is nothing but q raised by t and this is basically if I look at it it is going from i to q. Now as you can see here we told it is an ideal monotonic gas right we have this reversible isothermal expansion. Now in this case the change in internal energy du right there is no change in temperature right? there is no change in temperature temperature is constant but du for an ideal gas is CVDT for example right so there is if there is no change in temperature or mm, uh, if there is no change in temperature then uh, du is going to be 0 right if du is going to be 0 then delta is that then Q reversible is minus W reversible right so first of all delta s equals to 1 by t i to f del q rev which is q rev by t i to f now comes the part where the temperature is um, now at 30 degree celsius because we are keeping isothermal isothermal expansion right or isothermal 0.5 liters to 1 liters right this is the reversible isothermal expansion now if i am doing that temperature is constant and we have to find out what is q rev now Q rev is nothing but as you can see because there is no change in internal energy and delta u equals to 0 equals to Q rev plus W rev and therefore Q rev equals to minus W rev rev means reversible huh? rev means reversible I'm repeating the words just so that you become more and more familiar. So rev basically denotes reversible, and this is basically minus W rev because delta is zero because of the constant temperature. Again, delta is zero T equals to 30 degree Celsius constant. So this is one sub process, right? Where we are talking about reversible isothermal expansion from I to F. Now minus W rev and W rev is nothing but integral. PDV, right? Um, w rev is minus PDV, integral minus PDV, but there is a minus sign here, so minus minus becomes plus. So it is I to F PDV. So again, we are talking about ideal gas. So PV, uh, so you are telling that P, P is nothing but NRT by V, right? That's what I am written. So but T is constant, R is constant, N is constant. So NRT DIV. So this is basically NRT ln VF by V, right? I and F of the mission of instance. So now if that is so, then delta S is Q rate by T. So 1 by T, there is a 1 by T as you can see here, then NRT ln VF by V, right? N is the number of. So we are talking about one when an ideal monotonic gas, right? So, so we have we do we have not indicated n. So that's not a problem because we know the pressure, right? Initial pressure, right? The, 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 the state at the initial state we know the pressure, we know the volume, we know the because volume is 0.5 liters, we know R, we know the initial temperature also, which is 30, right? So basically, as you can see here, that for the process number one, sub process number one, right? So that's why I have given this is equals to PIVI by TI, right? N equals to PIVI by TI. Mm, PIVI by TI, there is an R missing. Uh, huh, so there is an NR, right? So because there is an R here, so N equals to PIVI by RTI and R cancels out. So this becomes just PIVI by TI. So yeah, it is, uh, that just becomes PIVI by TI and then PIVI by TI, right? Now, what we are telling in step 2, right, this is the step 2. So, this, um, what we did first is step 1, right, in step 1 is what we did. So, let's call it, instead of 1, let's call it step 1.
Okay. Now, if you have step one, now we are looking at the step two. What is step two? Step two, you keep the volume constant, but you increase the temperature to 100 degrees, right? From right, that was the thumb. So, and then heat it to 100 degrees Celsius at the same time, right? We have just divided into sub processes for uh, convenience. Now, here Q ref is going to be so volume is constant. So if that is so, Q ref okay equals to delta Q uh, so integral of delta Q ref which is integral of du. Uh, because we are not no longer volume is constant, so PDV, so PDV in this sub process, PDV is going to be zero, right? There is no volume change, right? The so volume is constant, so you have delta QR, which is basically integral du, and du is nothing but n C V M T T, right? C V M is the uh, molar heat capacity at constant volume. And which from equipment partition theorem we already know is nothing but um, 3 by 2 n kb, right? So, which is like 3 by 2 r, right? So, now you have delta is for sub process 2. If I am looking at sub process 2, you are basically looking at so q ref by t. Which is integral Ti to Tf du, right? right? So that's what I am doing. So it is basically du by T, and du is basically n C V T, and n is again Ti Vi by R Ti with 3 by 2 R, R again gets cancelled here, as you can see, and you have dt by T. So I can write Ti Vi by Ti, and then Tf by Ti whole to power 3 by 2, right? Because this 3 by 2 R came because CVM is basically like molar heat capacity. CVM denotes the molar heat capacity. Right? So you get now delta S total, which is the delta S for the sub process 1. Right? You just now add it and delta S for sub process 2. So, which basically becomes Pi Vi by Pi ln. So, you have in the first case ln Vf by Vi, right? You have ln Vf by Vi. This is equation say, 1. And you have now equation say, 2. Now, you add 1 and 2, then you have Pi Vi by Pi. You just do the simplification. You get ln Vf by Vi, Tf by Pi, or cross by 2. And you can also now plug in the values and check whether delta S is greater than C. Delta S has to be greater than C. Now, one thing, this is all fine. Now, how do you measure entropy? How do you measure entropy? Okay, so there are various ways to measure entropy. So, one of the ways is first we measure enthalpy, and we know that enthalpy, if I know the enthalpy, if I know the enthalpy, I can basically relate it to entropy. Okay, so that's what I will try to do because one of the ways you can immediately you could immediately see, say for at the transition temperature, delta H transformation. If I know uh, the delta S transformation is nothing but delta H transformation by the temperature of transformation, right? Now as you can understand that entropy measurement again is indirect, right? They are directly measurable quantities. If I tell these are directly measurable quantities. Directly means using some instrument. So you can measure C V, you can measure C P. Like this is the heat capacity at constant volume, heat capacity at constant pressure, then thermal expansion coefficient, then compress isothermal compressibility, even temperature, pressure, volume, all of these can be measured directly. However, if I want to measure enthalpy or you are to measure entropy, then basically you use something called calorimetry. So here, for example, I am giving an example of differential scanning calorimetry. Okay. Okay, so it's power uh, means, uh, controlled by power. So what we are talking about is, if you look at this very simple example here, you have the sample for which you require some properties, right? You want to be calorimetry, and here is the reference sample. Okay, and if you see the both the chambers, right, where you have sample, and when you have 
you know, the, the, the reference both are basically uh, both are basically connected to a thermocouple right they both are connected to thermocouple and there are there are these two heaters right there is one heater here there is one heater here right so we are telling the temperature of the sample plus the reference are increased at a constant rate okay and that is called the scanning rate okay so t0 is the initial temperature say then sr is the scanning rate which is in kelvin per second so at this constant rate you are increasing the uh, so sr is the scanning rate and so tt at any time t t is basically t0 which is the initial uh, temperature plus sr times small t small t is 10. Now as you can see here cp itself may be a function of temperature. So, if I tell Cp is in general, Cp is what? Cp itself is equals to Cp. Okay, Cp itself can change as a function of temperature. Right? Now, if tall Cp is not a function of temperature, um, uh, whether it is function of temperature or not, it does not really matter. So, if it is a function of temperature, it becomes slightly more complex. But anyway, what I want to tell, we are increasing the temperature of both the sample and the reference at the same rate, right? We are trying to do that. So, and we want to maintain same, same temperature in both. How do I maintain uh, uh, same temperature in both? If I know that there is a temperature increase in one, then I want to basically just increase the power of the heater in the other so that I can maintain the same temperature everywhere. So basically what I want to do the process is to transfer. So what I am trying to do, so you understand. So say for example, you have the sample and you have your reference. Now you are seeing that the sample is basically losing, means it is trying to lose the temperature, lose some temperature or it is uh, lose some temperature. Then what you want to do is you are just using the heater here so that again the sample comes to the same temperature. How do you do that? You want to transfer excess energy to or from the sample undergoing a physical or chemical process, right? So if it is undergoing, the sample is undergoing a physical process by which it is losing temperature, you want to transfer energy to it so that the sample again is maintained at the same temperature as that of the reference, right? So If there is no physical or chemical change of the sample at temperature T, if we assume that there is no physical chemical change of the sample at temperature T, then because if it is there, then you have to also think of the latent heat or the heat of transformation, right? If there is no physical or chemical change, then it becomes very easy because you have the initial temperature T0 and Qp is basically Cp times delta T, which is Cp times T minus T, right? And delta T is nothing but T minus T0, which is basically SR times T. Now, if physical and chemical process, if this physical chemical change is equal to true, then excess heat transfer to maintain the same change in temperature in the sample as that the reference is basically QP plus QP excess, right? That is what you have to give, right? Because if there is a physical or chemical change, right? If that is true. So, we are talking about no physical, if there is a physical, if physical or chemical change is true, if physical or chemical change is to be true, okay, then the excess heat transfer to maintain the same in temperature uh, in the sample, right, to same in temperature in the sample as in the reference, basically tells you, you require this QP but there is also a QP excess that is required, right? You require to have this QP and this QP excess. We call it QP excess, which is basically equals to now QP is Cp delta T, right? QP equal to you have seen QP equal to Cp delta T, but this QP excess corresponds to some Cp excess times delta, right? So this is some excessive capacity times delta T if there is a physical or chemical change that is basically true. Now Cp excess is nothing but Qp excess by delta T, right? Or this is basically Qp excess by SRT, okay, which is basically given by Joule by Kelvin. 
Now, if it is an endothermic process or an endothermic exothermic process, so what we are trying to look at is if there is no physical chemical change, then this is nothing but Cp delta T. Now, Cp itself being a function of temperature would have complicated the process, but if you assume that Cp is not a function of temperature for the temperature change that we are talking about, right? The temperature change, if we take the temperature change to be small and we assume that Cp is not changing with, um, in these temperature range, then you can write Qp equals to Cp delta D directly which is Cp into T minus T naught. Otherwise, Cp itself has to be expressed as a function of temperature and you have to find out the um, uh, integral um, Cp dt uh, and uh, the fair Cp itself is a function of temperature. So, you have to calculate the integral that is all. Now, but if there is a physical or chemical change of the sample, if there is a physical or chemical change of the sample, then you add this Qp excess. The Qp excess is related to Cp excess and the temperature difference delta T which is T minus T naught which is basically S at times T. Now, that if that is so, then Cp excess can be written as Qp excess by delta T or Qp excess by S at T. Now, if it is excess, uh, we can tell or uh, this is the excess one. So, this is basically in joule per Kelvin. So, now if you see it is an endothermic process, then as you know in the endothermic process, heat is absorbed, right. So, so basically you will see a peak like this, right, it is a positive peak. And the exothermic process you will see uh, it is released. So, you will see basically a negative peak. Right in the for an exothermic process. Now, if you look at this, delta H is Cp excess times delta T, right? So delta H is Cp excess dt integral T1 to T, right? So T1 to between T1 and T2 is what we are doing between two temperatures T1 and T2 is what we are uh, basically looking at, right? T1 is your say for example the reference temp the, the, the 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 initial temperature and T2 is your final temperature. So if I now integrate Cp excess dt, then what I get is basically the delta H associated with the physical or chemical change in the sample. That is how we measure delta H. Now, if I measure delta H, now you will tell, okay, you have measured delta H. So, what? How do you measure delta S? Okay, that is very interesting. Now, if I want to measure entropy, we know delta Q is TDS, right? If it is reversible, right? delta Q is reversible. So, what we know from second law, second law tells you delta Qp reversible equals to Tds, but delta Qp reversible is nothing but uh, P means constant pressure. So, it is nothing but dh which is equal to Cp dt. So, ds equals to Cp by T dt. Now, Cp is now you can now think of this as like it is a function of temperature. So, A plus B T plus C by T square plus D T square something like that, right. And we have some values, positive values for silver and nickel, okay, in different forms. Again, there is a temperature range that you have to give if you have such an empirical or experimentally determined expression. You have to also give the temperature range for which A, B, C, D, these positions are valid. Now, once you know this, once you know this, you already know delta H, right? You already know delta H. So, basically delta S is basically, I can tell very easily. Now, if from this expression itself, it is clear that from these two, from these relation, you can write ds equals to, right? ds equals to Cp by T dt and you can just do now the delta S is integral Cp by T dt for a temperature range Ti to say T. That is it, you can basically get delta S. Now, the delta S basically you can directly get from um, the delta H by T also, ok. If I know delta H, delta H by T will give me delta S for the transformation, right. This is how we can measure uh, entropy. Now, if you see there is one very interesting point here I want to tell that is Cp as you have seen from the from the device, the, 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 the device theory that Cp tends to 0 right but the heat capacity tends to 0 as T tends to 0 right. Now, we can also think of that 
uh, from device theory that cp equals to a t cubed is valid at low temperature till 0 kelvin at low temperature means temperatures below the room temperature now if you see that cp by t if i plot against t and there are these phase changes so basically this is my solid region this is my liquid and this is my gas as you can see cp by t extrapolated so at 0 it is 0 cp cp is going to be 0 at as t tends to 0 now cp is going to be 0 huh? so as t tends to 0 but t is not exactly equal to 0 so we are basically looking at some extrapolation that we want to do with the extrapolation is done with this relation cp equals to a p q right this this blue curve basically gives me that extrapolation part, right so we use that but you see typically for a solid the cp is increasing with temperature right it increases increases till the melting point right this is your melting point this is your melting point so if i have gone up to melting point now you see cp by t is discontinuous right it is discontinuous now suddenly now at the liquid again there is this is your cp by t and at the solid this is your cp by t and at tn this is discontinuous right there is a jump and then from this cp by t again you come down come down and then Again, there is a boiling, right? There is a boiling point. Now, at the boiling point, again, there is a jump, and then you get what is called gas, right? So, basically, the Cp by T is going uh, increasing. Now, it goes, and then from solid, when it goes to liquid, there is a jump at that melting point, and again, from liquid to gas, when it is going, there is a jump at the boiling point. You can easily understand this. Basically, if you Cp by T, again, remember ds equals to cp by t dt that's what we have done right we have written the cp by t dt now that means s equals to integral cp by t right integral of this class now if i do that you can see s basically if you look at the curve s again you have the solid you have solid here you have liquid here and your gas here. and as you can see the entropy goes starts from 0 at 0 Kelvin goes up then there is a delta s melt and then this delta s melt there is a transformation here right so there is at melting point there is a transfer there, there is a transformation right this is the melting transformation solid is transformed to liquid and in this case you have seen a you are seeing a jump in delta s right there is a jump and why is there a jump because you see you are adding heat you are adding heat to solid and then at some point the solid has changed to liquid you just go above tm the solid has changed to liquid right so now the liquid again there is a this entropy change right the entropy change is higher than that in the solid right the entropy itself is higher than that in the solid and then again at boiling point where the liquid has to transform to gas Again, you see there is a jump in the entropy, and that is the entropy of transformation, right? There is this delta S transformation, delta S transformation here. So this corresponds to delta S boiling, and this is the delta S melt, right? And right, this is delta S boil. So you can see that. And again, for the gas phase, definitely <coughs> entropy is much higher than in the solid phase. You can immediately see that. And you can appreciate that, that, that the, the dispersion will be much more or the number of energy states that will be accessible for gas will be much more than in the solid. Solid is much more compact than gas, right? So as a result, the entropy of solid is in general the lowest, then comes liquid and gas as the highest entropy, right? And remember, this, this jumps in the entropy of transformation or heats of transformation these jumps basically tell you that there is a transition that is taking place. I will also define later the order of transition. So I will end here today and we will try to continue this topic further in the next few classes.